In this episode of The Darker Side of Boxing, we're talking about a man who was undisputed middleweight champion for seven years. A hero in his home country of Argentina. A boxing legend who was also a drug abuser, a woman beater and a convicted murderer. This is the curse of Carlos Monzon on The Darker Side of Boxing. The Curse of Carlos Monzon. One of the greatest middleweight boxers, if not the greatest middleweight boxer of all time. But this episode isn't all about his boxing career and his legendary career in the middleweight division. This is about the murder of his partner. This is about the homicide. This is about beatings of former girlfriends. This is about the life and times of a man that wasn't all what he seemed to be outside of the ring. He was loved by the people, but he was cursed by women. And as always, Johnson Brown, you're with me here to discuss what is a tale of a fighter and a lover and an abuser. Absolutely, mate. I think you summed that up perfectly. He is definitely, uh, he was loved by the Argentinians uh, and, and the French as well because he was uh, far over there. And, and it's difficult because we, we as boxing fans we always look at Carlos Monzon as the, the guy in the ring rather than the guy outside the ring. And to be quite honest with you, the guy outside of the ring, I mean, I, I would like to call him a, a monster to be honest. He was the monster Monzon. Uh, he was a monster in the ring or an absolute monster in the ring, but even worse, he was a bit. He was a devil outside it, and and the way he treated women, and you know, it, it, uh, and how it all panned out for him, it was it's an interesting tale. Let's put it that way, and one that I believe you know it needs to be told, and it's a great one for us to really get our teeth into, and 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 go through his life outside the ring rather than inside it. Although we will touch on elements inside, predominantly it's going to be what he got up to outside of it. So to put into context, Carlos Monzon's life. We're going to take it back all the way to the beginning, to when he was born on August the 7th, 1942, born and named Carlos Roque Monzon. And he was born in a small town of San Javier in the northeast of Argentina, about 600 kilometres from the nation's capital, Buenos Aires. His family were of Macovi descent. Now, the Macovi are a native tribe of the Gran Chaco region of South America, which is located west of the Paraguay River and east of the Andes, and it's also shared between the Paraguayans, the Bolivians, and the Argentinians. So in 1950, when Carlos was seven years old, his parents, named Roque Monzon and Amalia Ledzima, decided to leave town to try and find a better life in the larger city of Santa Fe in Barraconitas Asti. Now, life was hard for Monzon, along with his family, which consisted of 12 siblings. Crazy. Now there are there are actually conflicting reports, but on record he was down as being the fifth born, and of course, like all these tales tell you about small town upbringings, they lived in a small house in a very poor neighbourhood. Yeah, they did, and it was a difficult upbringing for the, for the whole family, and it was sort of it was during a, a difficult time in the nineteen fifties because Argentina um, their economy was was in a terrible state with the country's current currency losing 70% of its value by 1951. Inflation did reach 50%, but it was it was a bit of a dire time, as well as the fact he lived in poverty with his with his siblings and, and of course, with his mum and dad. And, and Carlos actually had to resort to stealing food at times when they, when they couldn't get enough money to get some food on the table. And yeah, he would go and steal some food. He was, uh, as I say, the fifth oldest. I'm sure his other brothers and sisters would have done the same thing. But there was actually one particular incident, one time where he actually stole a pot of hot food for, from a neighbour's window while she was actually cooking it. It sounds quite funny. He actually just sneaks in and, and takes it and runs away with, with his brother. But they're actually caught red-handed by the local policeman. And the punishment dished out by that policeman was to stick his hand in in the boiling hot pot of food to teach him a lesson. So not only was it difficult coming up in, in such a really bad, dire neighbourhood, in difficult times, you get doing something you shouldn't have been. You know, the, the police, they ain't going to mess about and they will make an example of you. And burn his hand quite bad and clearly not the sort of thing we'd do today. Definitely, definitely difficult for Carlos. 
difficult neighbourhood, difficult life, difficult times, of course it was. And by the time Carlos reached the third grade, he was about eight years of age at this point. He actually dropped out of school in an attempt to help his family. He started working various jobs. So he had jobs such as a shoe shiner, a paper boy when he was very young before going on to deliver milk and gas tanks and then working in a meat plant. And as he got older, of course, he got stronger and he became a bigger lad. He became a bit of what we would refer to in England as a brick shit house. So <laughs> when, when he was 16 in 1958, he met Zalema and Canarsion Torres, with whom he had his first son, Carlos Alberto Monzon. And during this time, he began boxing at the Minera Boxing Club but was arrested several times for fighting in bars. This was something that you'll see was a pattern that was starting to emerge about Carlos Monzon very early on at this point in time. He liked to go out, he liked to have a drink, but he also liked to have a fight as well. And in his late teens, he was sent to prison for inciting a football riot in a stadium and for participating in another riot on a bus. Jesus Christ. (laughs) He definitely loved a fight, didn't he? I suppose that was... Again, knocking about with these type of guys and football being a, a big thing for the American fans. It's not American football, that is soccer. Obviously, he, he definitely loved the tear up and he actually gained extra money for beginning to peddle prostitutes. Now, this is at the, this is in his teens. I mean, probably late teens, sort of in between 16 and 17. He's getting involved in, in prostitutes, which is crazy. And so much so, he had to flee to Brazil for a while because the police were actually investigating him so obviously leaving his, his siblings behind now when he did return to Santa Fe in Argentina it was roughly around 1959 1960 about that time and Monzon obviously came back alone he didn't go back to live with his family but he began living on a ranch with his friend Lalo and Lalo's sister and they were basically just able to sort of hunt for food because well, I think they hunted the snakes and, and then they would eat. That was, that was their food. Their money, they, they didn't need so much money. But the, the main reason they needed a source of income was to, to have a drink and to go to the bar, which is, yeah, that, that's across the world. I mean, we had it over here and sort of roughly around these times where, you know, you go and work or you, you work on a farm or a ranch and then you, you need your money for your drinks. And that's what he did. And he also competed in some unofficial backstreet bouts to earn some extra beer money, basically. And get some money in his pocket and that was his life going into his in his late teens now just at this point i wanted to bring to the attention of a certain series that's out on netflix at the moment called mons on a knockout blow and it, it did inspire us to look at the the case of carlos mons on and in that particular series, you can actually see the dramatisation of, of how things went down. And his, his friend Lalo, in that particular series, actually ended up getting involved in a fight which he lost. And lost quite embarrassingly as well. And mm. moving on from that incident, in a distressing turn of events, Lalo actually ended up committing suicide by shooting himself after losing that arranged bar fight. And how it all came about is that he was angered by a guy that had made advances towards his sister. So... He arranged to fight him at the bar, only to end up getting knocked out. So once Lalo was laid to rest, Monzon was obviously still fuming with the guy that had beat Lalo up. So he decides to go out and seek his revenge. Now, while the guy was in the bar drinking, he walks up to him, and you can see this in the in the series. He walks up to him, goes behind him, smashes his head onto the bar multiple times, and absolutely sparks the guy the hell out before... The bartender and the owner of the bar as well turns around, pulls his gun out and says, stop, otherwise I'm going to shoot you. To which point, Monzon obviously walks away. So this bar fighting continued. Now, there was a particular altercation where Monzon and his friend took on five guys in a fight, which brought them both arrested, of course. Now, in a police interview the next morning, the policeman who was called Belisa was both impressed with his bravery, but also tired of arresting him every weekend for bar fighting. So... He decides at this point, you know, we need to channel this aggression into something productive. So he directed him to an acquaintance, Amelia Brusa, who ran a boxing gym. Now, Belisa told Carlos Monzon that he must go or he will find himself back in his police cell. But for six months this time, instead of just the night. It's quite an interesting one. Again, touching on the the, uh, the Monzon on Netflix. I mean, it is a good watch. Obviously, all in subtitles was that don't speak Spanish, but you do see this moment. And, and there was another source that did mention this as well. So there are a lot of dramatizations in, in the documentary, but a lot of it is, is pretty accurate. And, and it, we'll say that Belisa was the guy that, that sent him towards Brusa, who, who ran the boxing gym. Now, now Monzon impressed Brusa with his boxing ability. 
And quite simply, their relationship would go beyond just being a boxer and a trainer. They they become good friends, and and Bruce had became a father figure, a father figure that he didn't have. His father obviously did go missing, which is something we didn't mention. He was a bit of a drinker as well. Although Monson never touched, there were moments where you believe he might, and he doesn't. So. But then on on the 11th of May 1962, Monzon married Lalo's sister, who's Mercedes Beatrice Garcia, and nickname is Pelusa. Now, Pelusa, I say is, when you do watch the series of, of Pelusa, and when I've read things by doing our research, I must say, I, yeah, she's a really strong girl. She knows exactly what she wants, and it takes this sort of, a girl like Pelusa to, to, I think, channel like a, a Carlos Monzon, although this was in his early days, but... They were so they couldn't get scrap the money together to actually buy a mar- marriage license. So Bruce had paid for it where he was working. The meat plant they they gave the food etc for, for the wedding, and they would go and have three kids: Sylvia, Abel, Ricardo, and Carlos Raúl, who was adopted. Now I did also hear through another source that the rumor is is that Carlos Raúl, although he was adopted, he was actually Carlos Monzon is real son and it was the child of an affair wow well there you go there's something that i don't think uh, a lot of people might have known about it's, it's, it's interesting to know a little bit more about the context of his family and, and how his family life was was all working at this point in time so you move forward and you move into 1965 and monzon was arrested for assault and served around a month in prison that same year he finally got the opportunity to fight and train at the mecca of boxing in argentina the estadio luna park Juan Carlos Lecture, named Tito, was an Argentinian businessman, mainly involved in boxing events, and the owner of the Buenos Aires Luna Park Stadium. He would promote most of Monzon's fight from this point, with Bruiser being his coach, manager, and mentor. And you can see, again, in the documentary of, of how they all come about, and you get to see glimpses of what they believe was happening at the time from the stories that were told, where you could see Monzon is trying to really impress lecture and, and he ends up getting hurt in his first sparring session and then he ends up going on to see that actually this kid has actually got a lot of talent so he eventually decides to to take him on by 1966 monzon picked up his first real honor by winning the argentinian middleweight title against jorge fernandez by unanimous decision and in 1967, following Monzon's below-par performance in a draw against Benny Briscoe, where he was criticised publicly, Monzon bumped in to the biggest boxing star in Argentina at the time, who was Nicolini Locci, who was the current Argentina lightweight champion, and was a couple of years ahead of Monzon in terms of his career. Now, rumour has it that they actually exchanged words in the toilet, and Locci ended up giving Monzon some words of wisdom. Both fighters had large entourages with them all the time. And as Monzon and Lochi actually emerge from their friendly chat in the toilet, they walk out into the bar and their entourages are actually in the midst of a full-blown bar fight. And this is documented in the docu- in the documentary series where basically Lochi's entourage is such a slagging off Monzon and his below-par performances and they don't think he's going to make it and obviously Bruce is there he's hearing about it he goes over to try and calmly say to them stop what you're saying I don't want to hear you chat shit about my guy and then the rest of his entourage hears it and then by the time these two go out from their altercation or confrontation in the toilet they come out and <laughs> both entourages are scrapping in the middle of a club <laughs> yeah uh, it was a great little episode, that bit. Um, I really enjoyed that because, obviously, Loche is, is obviously, a, he was a massive star. He was a couple of years ahead. I think after a couple of years later, he went on to become a, the world champion and, and, and an interesting guy as well. And So, really good story. And I hope it is true. We'll, we can't, we'll probably plug this a few times, but it's definitely one to go and watch. Now, the following month in, in Monzon's next fight, he actually outpointed Jorge Fernandez once again this time it's for the South American middleweight title. So he's now a, a champion of the continent. And after the fight, Monzon was at a family party when an incident with, with a photographer occurred. Now, he's, this guy's name, the photographer, was Daniel Moreno. And he was taking pictures when uh, Carlos basically just did, he took a bit of a disliking to him and, uh, and he confronted him. Um, and he had a little go at him and he ended up punching Moreno in the face which actually resulted in Marino pressing charges against Monzon and getting him arrested. 
crazy, mad little story there, but this is something you will get regularly with Monson. He didn't quite like the paparazzi. Now, also in the same year, Monson on three separate occasions was charged for fighting once again. Once at his mother-in-law's house, the other was at a club, and the other and the other one was at a casino. Now, as I mentioned, many of these incidents were always involving paparazzi, as, as well as just normal people, but predominantly paparazzi. Monzon just basically did, he didn't like the paps. He were always resorted in a physical violence. Probably the one thing I will say about Monzon, which I'm, I'm not me head to that one because I couldn't think of anything worse than ge- a geezer getting in your face taking pictures. He was one not to be messed with, basically, by the paps. And they all knew it, but they all still obviously decided to, to, to take the piss a little bit and, and, and Monzon would give him a whack. <laughs> That's basically how it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was getting his reputation, wasn't he, outside of the ring of, of of always getting involved in altercations in some way, shape, or form. And when you when you think about the paparazzi and the reputation they have, it leads you to believe that maybe a lot of them was there to antagonise him, to kind of get this from him, to get the aggression out of him, because they knew he would he would flip a switch quite easily. And I do genuinely believe that's why they did it. That is exactly why they did it. We've seen Absolutely. what the we've seen what the paparazzi you know even can do now in in this day and age. And still hound people like there's no tomorrow so of course that's probably likely that that's why they did it because they know provoking someone like a Carlos Monzon would would certainly get the the press headlines that they wanted so back to his in-ring career at this point now finally seven years after making his professional debut and in his 80th fight on November the 7th 1970 Monzon gets the opportunity to fight Nino Benavite in Rome in Italy for the WBC middleweight championship of the world now during the weigh-in Monzon claims that Benavides slapped his ass now Monzon was <laughs> pissed and we've just been speaking about how easily provoked he is he's pissed at this point and said I looked at him and I thought tonight I will kill you when the referee stopped the fight he was correct that night I would have killed Benavides <laughs> oh dear now, I believe Nino probably thought he was just trying to wind him up a little bit, um, not realising, uh, trying to play mind games with him, basically, he didn't like the fact that he touched his ass. <laughs> so, Monson was basically a complete underdog on the night and he would go on to knock out Benavite in, in the 12th of the schedule 15 with that thunderous right hand and, you know, for the boxing fans, do go and have a look at it. Excellent finish. So he's welcome back to Argentina as a national hero. And from this point, every time one's on fault, Argentina would stand still. The, the cities had no traffic. All the TV sets and radios are all tuned on for his fights. He was basically the star now. He was the man of Argentina. And, and basically the whole country would come to a stop and a halt for Monzon's fights. It's crazy that that's what he did, but it took him 80 fights to do it, which is is, is quite unheard of, really. I mean, oh, well. eight, 80 fights before he got that big opportunity to fight for a world title. And in the meantime, outside of the rings, he's like Marmite, the guy. Some people love him, some people hate him, but obviously... Being Argentinian and representing his country was was obviously the biggest thing for the Argentinians at the time. They absolutely loved him. They gave him an absolute hero's welcome home after he beat Benavidi in Italy. We move on and talk a little bit more about Monzon. And it's well publicly known about his life and from transcripts and interviews that he'd done before the end that Monzon was a heavy smoker throughout his boxing career and it's crazy to even speak about that as well the fact that he was a world championship boxer but yet he was also a heavy smoker and was able to go in there and and, and fight now following his world title exploits he began to smoke a rumored five packs a day and drink excessively now author george diaz smith wrote this about carlos a guy like ricardo mayorga would be a novice compared to the likes of Iron Lunged Monzon. Nobody could figure this out. For all of the years that I'd seen him, Monzon never gasped for air, tired or opened his mouth gagging for oxygen in any round. Six months after that Benavidi victory, Monzon repeated the feat, but this time it only took him three rounds to knock out the Italian in Monte Carlo. So we're just telling you that story there about the fact that this guy was rumoured to be smoking five packs of cigarettes a day. And we don't even know if this was a 10-deck or a 20-deck, you know. This could have been a 20-deck of cigarettes (laughs) for all we know. And he's going around smoking them, chain-smoking them all day. But yet he was able to go 12 rounds in the first fight with Benavidi and and knock him out. And then obviously go on to to stop him in three rounds in the repeat performance. So absolutely crazy to think that a professional boxer could do that. It is crazy. 
crazy, is he? And the fact that just the way he fought, he was, as, as George Dead Smith put, you know, iron lung, I think he, he hit the nail on the head with that one. I think that's that's a great way of describing Monzon uh, as a fighter, considering the fact that he's he's smoking, what, 100 fags a day. I mean, Jesus Christ, that's, that's insane. Well, anyway, I mean, that, that second fight as well, being in Monte Carlo, was almost like a bit of an adoptive home. And the French, uh, I know it's Monte Carlo, it, it's sort of, it's part of France, isn't it? For me, personally, I always see it as part of France, although it's sort of his own country. But he was adored there as well. He was adored in France and he was adored in Argentina. And and not long after his first defence of the title, uh, Monzon was once, he was well, he was arrested again for participating in a scuffle. But this time this was in a pizza parlour which resulted in, in another night in the nick. Now, following his release the next morning, police determined that he was only trying to break up the fighting and, and um, amongst his friends in another table. So, yeah, arrested again. I'm guessing the police may have may have given him a little bit of a buy there. I'm sure he probably was well involved in that. And five days after stopping Emil Griffith, who was a guy who had never been stopped before to retain his WBA, WBC and ring the Neil at middleweight titles, Monzon was arrested once again, but this time it's for hitting a guy on a bike. Now, he did actually, I think he hit him in his Mercedes. He he, he knocked him over, and, and the way it was out there is they will, you know, the guy that's been in a car, he goes in prison for, or he goes goes into a police cell for the night, and but he was later released without charge. So within that <laughs> a short space of time, he's been arrested twice. I think we're getting a picture of what, what Monzon was really like. Yeah, it was a bit of a bit of a shit out of the outside of the ring. He was always involved in trouble all the time. He was, well, as we go on throughout this this tale and this case of Carlos Monzon, you'll get to hear how it actually progresses throughout the years. So we we move on from from that particular incident. And in 1972, Monzon is named the Joint Fighter of the Year by the Ring Magazine alongside a certain Muhammad Ali. But Boxing Illustrated and the Boxing Writers and Association of America both name Monzon their fighter of the year so he's on top of the world and he'd become an absolute megastar in argentina so what's next for him at this point in time well next for carlos monzon was to become a movie star now his trainer bruce has said when carlos made the movie el macho women went crazy they threw themselves at him the actress ursula andres came from hollywood to look for him i told him to forget about girls while he was in the ring and he understood so, November the 2nd, 1972, an appeal court decided to uphold a lower court's decision for Monzon to stand trial for the assault against Daniel Moreno, which we heard a little bit earlier on, and that was back at the family party in 1967. So, Monzon said, both parties agreed to an arrangement in which the photographer withdrew the complaint. I'm surprised as to the way this has come up after such a long time, just before my fight with Briscoe. And then Benny Briscoe, just just to touch on for the boxing fans, was was he, he also fought marvelous Marvin Hagler, which is this is an interesting one. He was the one guy that that fought the pair of them. One fight we've we've discussed previously, so on a separate episode. But yeah, moving on on, on February twenty eighth, nineteen seventy three, Monzon had a massive fight with his wife Pelusa, which was basically nothing out of the ordinary. Monzon would go on to be all of his wives and all of his girlfriends on a regular basis. There's something he had. I mean, we, we addressed the fact he was a heavy smoker and he was a heavy drinker. He was a heavy drinker. And when he drunk, he was an absolute arsehole. And, and he would beat his, his missus, whoever was around at the time. He, they're going to get a good old pasting. That was just the way he was. And it's dreadful. I mean, he's an absolute monster. You know, we, we can't condone that behaviour. And But in this particular incident, it was a bit of sweet revenge for Polisa. So it turned nasty. Basically, Polisa was tired of putting up with a crap because that's the sort of person she was. And she shot him twice. <laughs> she, <laughs> shot him, she shot him once in the right forearm and then once on the right shoulder blade with a shotgun as well, my head. Now, he's a big guy, over six foot. So, I mean, a shotgun as well. I mean, it, it must have been from a distance. If that was close range, that surely would have killed him. So, Monzon, at the time, the reason why she shot him was the fact that he was taking liberties. He was basically leaving the house to go and spend some time with another woman. And Monzon told police that he was actually cleaning his 32 caliber shotgun when he shot himself twice. So, he obviously gave her, gave her a beating. She had enough. She shot him. 
and he told police that he shot himself clean and that how you shoot yourself twice I would put a big question mark over that I think you know you shoot yourself once cleaning the gun possibly twice yeah I, I doubt that's true so <laughs> if she told police a different version as well she said she accidentally shot him she was holding the gun and it, and it went off and it hit him and she, she accidentally shot him twice I mean the whole it's just the craziness of Argentina really in this in this era in, in the 70s and the next day, police actually, she, she backtracked on her story and she, she went with Carlos's story and she said, no, that, he actually shot himself while he's carrying a gun. Um, it was all a little bit suspect, clearly. Uh, the police obviously weren't that bothered. I don't think they were too bothered as well with, with domestic violence. And, and the police just accepted the claims and they didn't bother investigating any further. And, and one interesting fact is that gunshot wound in the arm actually needed seven hours of surgery to have that removed. But the one that actually went into his back stayed in the back for the rest of his life. Wow, that's that's a mental story. I can't <laughs> even believe that. That is something I never knew about Carlos Monzon and that particular incident. To be honest with you, I think that's a bit crazy. <laughs> so he got shot by his, he got shot by Palusa, who was obviously well within her rights to retaliate. I mean, obviously it's a bit brutal in retaliation, of course, but. <laughs> Yeah, well within the rights to do so, but the fact that he ended up having one bullet lodged in his back for the rest of his life is something that, again, I don't know if a lot of people do know that. I think anyone that might have studied Monzon's life and career will probably know it, but for, for those of you that don't, well, there you go. There's a there's a great little story for you on the Carlos Monzon middleweight champion of the world. So, in 1974 then, Monzon was stripped of his WBC title for not defending his title enough. Now, Although the urine sample he gave to the anti-doping body probably didn't help him either because it was actually a cup of champagne and not a cup of piss. So he decides that he couldn't be asked doing all this anti-doping stuff. He felt like he was the champion. He expresses so much that how good of a champion he was, how great of a champion he was. Why does he need to do this? So he decides to put champagne in the sample instead of putting urine in there. And this kind of makes you feel that this was a an indication of something he may have been hiding. I mean, why would he not want to give a piss sample at that point? Why would he not want to do that? Now, many believed at the time that he was using cocaine and he was using a lot of it. And that was his drug of choice. Now, he was only actually stripped of the WBC title. He actually still went on and held the WBA, the Ring of the Lineal Middleweight titles. Bruce said, his trainer, Monzon was always Monzon, living in the fast lane, attending parties, driving a Mercedes, and always a centre of attention on magazines and on television programmes. Therefore, at this point in time, you can you can sort of sense that his activities outside of the ring uh, are more what he's involved in more than he's fighting i think he's got to the point where he's fighting you just get a t- ticking by to get the money he loves the money he loves the parties and he certainly loved the women and going back to the monzon docuseries that they did on netflix there's a moment where he's literally gets two girls from a party which looks like some sort of swingers party that they're doing and he takes them both into the room. He makes the the servant stand there and, and, and watch for a certain period of time as to what was going on. Makes them pour him a drink. He says, do you want to touch any of them? And then he sends him away on his way. And then that's when he comes in, at the end of that is when he gets his piss sample. Again, it is dramatization. Of course, a lot of this could just be made for the TV. It's, it's likely that it is. But just to actually even think that this was kind of what monzon was like that that kind of gives you a little bit of an inkling of what the guy was like at the time living in the fast lane so i think it was becoming evident now that his wife palusa had had enough of the persistent beatings so maybe he would have thought monzon would have decided to be a bit more of a a devoted husband for a while especially considering his wife almost killed him (laughs) but instead on October the 27th, 1974, Monzon is arrested yet again for beating his wife and would be later prosecuted for domestic violence for punching her in the face at the son's birthday party. Wow. I mean, the the guy has obviously got some cooners because, you know, your wife's almost shot you. She's obviously not one to be messed with. She's pissed off of his, his persistent beating, his persistent cheating, you know, you would think he would he would curb it a little bit. Obviously not. And, and the fact that he did it as well at his son's birthday party just says to you that the drink was taken over Monzo at this point. And he, he it, it just, it ruled him. And and while sort of 
it, it looked like he was going to... I think he does go down. We'll, we'll discuss it in a little while. But, well, under house arrest, basically, from, from the incident, he was under house arrest. I mean, again, that just doesn't seem... That seems very strange to me. You've you've just been arrested for domestic violence and then they decide to put you under house arrest where you're going to be in the house with his wife. Seems a bit stupid, really. But while I'm under house arrest, an article was published. Now, this article was titled Monzon Mark for Death. Now this is uh, I've got a, I've got a tip my hat and a big mention to crime and sport. We pulled this out of the hat and and it's a great little segue, a great little story. And and this was in relation to a right wing Argentinian political extremist group called Triple A, and they wanted to take over the government. Now in this article they said they wanted to clean up the morals of showbiz and the country. So they put together they actually put together two death lists. Now one of the death lists was all with political guys who, who they wanted to get rid of. And the second list was for the showbiz side, and, and it included Carlos Monzon. Now, although still married at the time, his bit on the side at, at this moment was Susana Jimenez. Now, she was also on the list, and it basically stated that everybody on those lists had 72 hours to leave Argentina or be killed. <laughs> a, a very interesting situation you're under house arrest and now all of a sudden you're seeing this in an article yeah, jesus he must be thinking he must be a little bit shook himself but anyway nothing nothing come of it i mean obviously it didn't happen it was just obviously threats empty promises but during 1974 monzon did start his movie career and, it, and he was he starred in a movie called la mary and that was where he did meet Susana jimenez now, the two actually played husband and wife in the film. When the movie was premiered in Buenos Aires, police actually confronted Susanna and threatened her, which resulted in a heated argument. Now, Carlos Monzon did nothing of it. Another incident there, which basically shows you that his, his relationship with police was basically coming to an end. So by 1975, Monzon and Jimenez did begun a very well-publicised affair which led to Monzon and Palouse separating. Finally, Palouse had escaped the the clutches of Monzon's lucky escape. Oh, yeah, exactly, lucky escape. The clutches of Monzon's terrible grip. So the celebrity couple were pictured everywhere, and it was everywhere they went, plastered all over the local newspapers. And it wasn't long before Susana Jimenez would be pictured frequently wearing rather large sunglasses. Now. Usually when you hear of cases of domestic violence, it always involves the victim wearing a large pair of sunglasses. And the reason for that, of course, is to disguise bruises from domestic abuse at the hands of Carlos Monzon. And she was eventually admitted to hospital after one absolute savage beating. But because she loved him and their relationship commanded massive public attention, she stuck by him. And according to Susanna, she said Carlos would drink and become aggressive. The more he drank, the more it affected their relationship. Now, why the hell would you want to do that? Why the hell would you stick by somebody that is doing that to you? But again, it's a case of you can't really comment on how that person's feeling at the time to fully understand what they're going through. It's an agonising situation. We've never experienced that sort of domestic violence against ourselves as, as hosts of the podcast, so we can't really make that judgment on that, but we can only really speculate as to domestic violence cases that we've seen in the past. So they've got this sort of undying love for, for the abuser, essentially, and they too scared to leave him and she's making up excuses as to to why she's going to stick by him and this was another incident where he'd absolutely beat the living shit out of her but yet she still wanted to stick by him yeah it's it's, it's a crazy one you, you can't really get your head around it. it this abusive relationship it's been going on for, for several years and this situation was no different i suppose the fact that they were very public you know that she was a mega star mega actress in argentina he was a mega star you know, you know they were they were a celebrity couple, and maybe she just felt that, you know, because of that, she was going to stick by him. And interesting that, that she did. And funny enough, the next part was it. Then after after this situation with with Susanna was on on August second, nineteen seventy six. Carlos was actually sent to a year and a half in prison for the assault of that photographer. Uh, he pop, pops up again. What like almost what. So as in 67, I believe, so what, 10 years later? Now, he immediately, as in Monzon, immediately, immediately filed for appeal, which meant that he would remain free while the appeal was pending. Then on December 7th, uh, 1976, the judge ruled that the injuries sustained on the photographer 
were not serious enough to warrant a prison sentence and the case was closed. So he got away with a year and a half in Nick. Interesting one. Now, I don't know why, what, what this photographer clearly had it out for Mons on. Like we just mentioned earlier with the Paps, he really wanted to, to, to send Carlos down. I'm sort of pleased that they didn't really, because I think that was a bit of a silly one, considering all the other stuff he's been getting into. That was the end of that case. In terms of his boxing career, Carlos Monzon announced his retirement in August of 1977, following two victories over Colombian Rodrigo Valdez. And he said, after the bout, I just looked in the mirror and said to myself, Monzon was never flawed before. Monzon is a great champion. He must always be remembered as a great champion. So I quit. So we move on to December the 15th, 1977, and in an appeals court, the case where he was under house arrest for assaulting his ex-wife at the son's birthday party is upheld. Official sources say that Monzon was unlikely to be given a six-month prison sentence because the government will probably give him a Christmas pardon. So <laughs> his celebrity status in Argentina at this point, we can't even probably do give you the right words to make you understand how much of a celebrity he was and how much they absolutely adored him. And no matter what he he did at this point in time, in the eyes of, of people in Argentina, he could do no wrong. So they made a decision to do the house arrest, as you were talking about earlier, rather than giving him a six-month prison sentence. And it's just unbelievable. Unbelievable, like, the sort of really the, the sort of things they could get away with back then. It, it, it baffles me. It really does. And obviously, he's, the fact he was he's a superstar, he got, he got away with these things. And, and in 1978, Susanna, obviously, we got tired as well of the persistent beatings by Monzon. And she left him. She had enough. So, but it wasn't long. So, in 78, she left him. And it wasn't long before he met someone else while he continued to work in movies and modelling, obviously now away from the ring. And he was actually pictured with a Uruguayan model or a stroke ballerina who was Alicia Munez. Uh, she was only 22 years old. She was 13 years younger than Carlos. Now, he was interviewed in 1979 about his domestic abuse towards women. He was basically indicating that he turned over a new leaf and he's going to be a new Monzon. Now, he said in his own words, the violence is my fault. It's my worst fault. All my friends tell me that before I get angry, I should count to 10. But when I get to two, I explode. <laughs> so, <laughs> <You know. laughs> yeah, it just says, uh, maybe the fact that uh, he, he left school so early, he probably could count to 10, bless him. Who knows? It's just a clear indication again of what he was all about. Now, in February 1981, after turning over this new leaf, he was actually arrested with possession of a shotgun or a gun. I don't know what gun it was. I said shotgun. It could be any old gun. Uh, and he actually did one month in prison. So he actually did go down for a year and he served the prison from March until April. He's released in April. When you hear the words that are being spoken in that particular interview, I think the writing's just there. It's on the wall. The warning signs are there. The warning signs are 100% there. And as we get on to towards the end of the tale of the case of Carlos Monzon, we'll certainly get to see why things should have been done a little bit sooner with Monzon and, and months here and months there and getting away with things because he was such a celebrity in Argentina just shouldn't have really happened. So we're back in 1981. Monzon and Alicia were married in Miami and they had a child together. Maximiliano Roque, a.k.a. Maxi. But again, his violent behaviour continued. They had a turbulent on and off relationship which eventually came to an end of sorts in 1984. Now, they did continue to stay in contact for the sake of their son, Maxi. Now, when Alicia tried to get back into modelling in 1987, she gave an interview about Monzon saying, I love him, but he'll never change. He'll continue being violent. I cannot go back to living with him, but neither can I live without him. So sad, isn't it, really? That these, these, she was only a young girl as well. And I mean, we say that she was a young girl. His other wife and, and his other girlfriends were, were the same. So you know, it's something about him. They just wanted to be around this, this violent animal. And, and although we have, you know, we've giggled a couple of times about certain things, this is where we get to sort of the seriousness uh, uh, of what Carlos Monson was about. And obviously part of the reason why we're doing this series and why he, he is part of this series, Dark Side of Boxing. And, and it is the murder or the accidental death of Elisa Munez. So on February the 14th, 1988, 
at the resort city of Mar del Plata in Pedro Zani around 4.30 in the morning, Alicia and Carlos had a loud and heated argument after spending the night drinking together at a casino and then a nightclub. Now, by Monzon's accounts, the argument was about child maintenance for the son that resulted in a fight, or more like a one-sided beating. It's theorised that Alicia was hit in the face with such force that she began to bleed, and as she tried to escape from the monster Monzon, she bled onto the stairs in her escape before locking herself in the bedroom. Now, Monzon burst through the door and continued his assault, which resulted in both falling from the second floor balcony. Monzon ended up with a three broken ribs and a dislocated shoulder, whereas Alicia tragically died from her injuries. By accounts, they obviously had the row. Monzon, he tells police that um, he doesn't remember what happened because basically he was just too wasted after their, their shenanigans. I think they, they had a meal or a barbecue in a day and then they went out, got ready and as, I, as you said, Phil, they, they sort of went to a, a casino and onto a nightclub. And so Carlos was, they, they were both wasted. She was as well. Um, and he did admit to fighting with Alicia, hitting her before grabbing her by the throat and then forcing her back onto the balcony. Now, this is where he says that while he had by the throat, she jumped off. Now, in an attempt to try and save her from falling, he fell too. That was his account of, the, of how it went. Now, obviously, Monzon was arrested and he was sent to the prison, which was the, the Baton Penitentiary in Unit 15. Now, obviously, due to Monzon being such a famous celebrity in Argentina, the murder case was extremely public, probably the equivalent of what we what we now know today of OJ Simpson. Uh, it was that big in Argentina. It was huge. Now, due to the magnitude, certain logistics demanded certain attention, that wouldn't normally matter, like the fact when the warden gave the press access to one of the prison cells just to show the nation what conditions Monson was living in. It's crazy, this bit. I mean, it's well documented in that documentary and well dramatised in that documentary where you, you see what was going on at the time, the frenzy. You had people that were supporting Monzon. You had people that were against Monzon. You had women's rights out there going absolutely ape shit and, and going nuts at all the people that were involved in the case. And what that documentary does sort of give you a bit of an insight to was, was how well publicised it was. And the OJ Simpson trial was probably the, the, the best comparison you can make as to how significant of a of a murder trial this was going to be at this point in time it was mentioned that monzon was just going to be treated like any other inmate although prison guards were a lot more lenient on him some were even starstruck and actually addressed carlos monzon as champ so the prison guards would go off that reputation that love that people had for him that I was talking about earlier people would absolutely love the guy so much so that they they would see past these things they would make their own justifications as to what actually happened and theorize as to what actually happened and even the prison guards were calling him champ while the case was under investigation monzon gave a statement to the press saying i am well and confident all should be calm because I am going to leave here soon because I am innocent and I believe in God and justice. They are some of the most hypocritical words you've probably ever heard coming out of a murderer's mouth because he's saying he believes in God and he believes in justice. But yet, as far as what we know, he killed Alicia Munez. So Roberto De Luca was appointed as Monzon's defence lawyer and Dr Vargas Rissi was the prosecution lawyer and already knew Alicia personally and the lead detective of the case was Gustavo Parisi. Now the initial coroner's report, which was conducted by Dr. Tamini, concluded that Munizzi's death was the cause of trauma to the brain, indicating the impact of the fall was the reason for her death. They did report the injuries to the neck muscles, but they concluded that those injuries were sustained due to the fall and the serious damage to the cranial brace. This still didn't rule out the possibility of her being pushed rather than committing suicide, though. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's, that's one thing. I mean, the, the coroner's report, I mean, I suppose if you're falling, she does fall from the balcony and she hits her face. Uh, and obviously they're saying that the cranial base of, of the head was the impact which resulted in the injuries on the neck. 
I suppose that's one way of seeing it. But again, it's true. Was she pushed? Was she like that? If she pushed or, or did she jump? She could have jumped in fear for her life anyway. And because it was only two stories, you know, second floor, you could probably jump off of that and be okay if you landed on your feet. You might have broken an ankle or something. But, you know, you land head first, chances are you're going to die like you did. Now, after burying Alicia, this is actually really crazy part of the whole thing. And, and, and I did look into this a little bit. And this is true. And after burying Alicia, her grave was actually stuck up for further inspection on the, of the body at the request of Munez's family. Now, because of the prosecuting team wanted to prove that she was, whether she was already dead or at least unconscious before they feel Monzon threw her off of the balcony. Now, Detective per- Parisi actually noticed that Alicia's wrists were not broken when analysing the body in detail. And the natural reaction of anyone when jumping off or falling from a height is that you put your hands out and so you're probably going to break your wrist if you are going, you know, if, if you're going feet first, you're probably going to break your ankle or whatever. If you're going head first, your natural reaction, obviously, is just put your hands out in front of you. Now, the defence, who are always a step behind the prosecution team and the police, actually contested that she could have fell feet first and therefore they should be looking at the fact that she could have landed on knees and broke her knees. Not quite really understanding that because if you land on your knees the impact of your knees is going to take that weight away and you're not going to cause as much damage on the head either way those were the theories behind the prosecution and the defense team at the time now what happened next was even more b- bizarre and again dramatized in the documentary so i know we've mentioned it on multiple occasions but if you've listened to this episode, once you've listened in full, please go and, and watch it because I think you'll find it really interesting. Again, I can only stress that it is real a real dramatization and, and, and obviously some of the facts may not be a hundred percent correct in that. Now, during this bizarre and utterly distasteful autopsy where several parties were actually present in the room, it was noticed by one of the coroners that a neck muscle had been removed. The sternoclenoid mastoid muscle, which is the muscle that could prove if Muniz had died by strangulation or not. Now, the second coroner report said Muniz had a fracture of the hyoid bone, larynx and tracheal cartilage, plus hematoma in the back of the head and mastoid region with strangulation marks. Now, these injuries were substantial enough to be the cause of the victim's death. In the coroner's opinion, Monzon strangled Muniz to death and then threw her off the balcony. Wow, crazy, isn't it? You've got two different coroner reports there. One saying the the fall and landing on the head is the result of her death, and then you've got another one saying strangulation, and the fact that neck muscle was removed. I mean, that could, that absolutely baffled me. Now, obviously, the question was, why were there two conflicting coroner reports, and why were they so different? And the initial coroner indicated that the second autopsy was performed on a body that had advanced state of decay a body that had already been manipulated, first by them, the coroners, and then by the funeral parlor. Also, he could not guarantee that the body was in the same condition when it got to Bronner's areas, when he actually conducted the autopsy. And basically, he was asked when prompted about the missing muscle. Dr. Tomini, who did perform the first coroner report, the first autopsy, insisted that that neck muscle, and I'm not going to try and pronounce it, you've done it really well, Sean, this, I'm not even going to go there. So this neck muscle was in place when the work was done on the body and that the muscle wouldn't have proven anything anyway. That was what he felt. That's crazy, isn't it? It makes you really start to theorise as to whether there was a lot of foul play going on behind the scenes. Uh, again, <sighs> you, you know that Monzon, he knows a lot of people in Argentina and a lot of people love him and it makes you wonder who was really batting for his side in, in this case in this incident as to a bit of tampering going on. It sounds pretty sick to be honest with you that that they might have even tampered with, with the body and, and to try and prove his innocence, you know, something was done or somebody was paid off and I know it might sound really wild to say it but it's not out of the, the reaches of what Carlos Monzon's popularity and status was like in Argentina at this point in time. So we move on to a different part of the case now and actual witness-based evidence. A homeless man, or a hobo as, as what's known as in Argentina, named Mr. Sanis, testified to Gustavo Parisi that he saw Monzon drag monies from the taxi into the house and he decided to go and take a closer look from the bushes before he actually saw 
Carlos Monzon lift her up in the air by her neck and choke her to death. And he also witnessed Monzon lifting her onto his shoulders and throwing her dead body over the balcony to make it look like she jumped off the balcony. And he then removed his clothes and jumped off the balcony himself. And the coroner's report coincided conclusively with Mr. Sani's version of events. Interesting. There are elements of that story that you sort of feel that probably were true. I think maybe he he may have said certain things that which I don't think quite happened. Maybe he was he see it, but he he probably rather sometimes when you see something and then and then afterwards you think about it, maybe it's just add a little extra. But it was pretty bang on, and it, it, it mentioned you know it matched the coroner's report, the second coroner's report. Now, in an attempt to discredit Mister Sanez's story, the defence attorney found evidence that two days before he made his voluntary eyewitness statement, an anonymous person opened an account in the name, in his name, in Buenos Aires, and made a deposit of 20,000 Ustral. The day after he reported that version, his version, to the police, another deposit of 10,000 Ustral was made. Now, a federal officer in a division of frauds and scams took a statement from a guy, the owner of a very important restaurant, apparently, who claimed to have seen Mr. Sands 300 miles away from Pedro Zani, looking through the bins in this area at the very moment that Munez died. So it basically discredited his story. Now, a second eyewitness also gave evidence, which which was completely conflicting and different to his version of events, and, and that further discredited his, his evidence. So it was tainted and it was impossible to use in a court of law. Do One thing you do see as well is, is in that series, there are actually documentary that there's interviews and footages of people, the reporters, etc., and headlines. So this is how it was. This wasn't like dramatised. This was actually really specific and it did ruin that statement by him. Again, you just feel like there's there's so many bits of foul play going on here in in one sense or another sense that it it was like the defense's every attempt to try and clear Carlos Monzon and and maintain his innocence. So the defense decides to sort further clarification on whether strangulation was the main cause of death by requesting professional assistance. They discovered that it is common for a victim to lose control of their bowels, automatically defecating themselves during strangulation, and yet there were no traces of excrement found at all on Alicia's body. So another theory that the defence are trying to throw up to try and maintain the innocence of Carlos Monzon, and yet again it's dispelled by the fact that the evidence is just not there. They're trying to put a theory into place of what they believe has has happened and, and why Carlos Monzon apparently didn't murder her and why she committed suicide or so they say they just had to start throwing up every avenue possible of ways in which it makes Carlos Monzon innocent which uh, I know obviously defence lawyers are, are paid to defend but this felt very much like it was all about trying to get the champion out of prison and we talked about the prison guards earlier how they referred to him as tramp it was like trying to get the champion and keep him out of prison whilst in prison and awaiting his trial, a close friend of Carlos in the movie business, Alfredo, jumped 11 stories to his death for reasons that are unknown, even today. Nobody knows why Alfredo decided to commit suicide. And while his dead body lay on the floor, pedestrians gathered with the press, and they actually showed his lifeless corpse covered with a white sheet on national television. So this was absolutely, again, it's just a crazy incident which nobody knows the reasons as to why he committed suicide but yet the press again like they are like they are coyotes they're all over it they're there with the cameras <laughs> and they've got the cameras on this dead body in the middle of the street well obviously pedestrians are there sort of shocked as, as to what's going on and it's again it's just another another crazy moment really uh, in, in this period of time and, and this big case that's going on and it really makes you wonder why alfredo committed suicide was it something to do with the case was it he was depressed was he going through bad periods of time we'll just never know but it's just so coincidental that it happened during such a, a period of time where there's such a big case going on it, it really does make you wonder it does because the first thing you sort of think is, is did he know something that no one else knew that's the first thing you sort of think of 
maybe he knew too much. Again, is it a coincidence? We don't know. But the trial of Carlos Monzon started on June 28, 1989, over a year since the actual incident. His lawyers tried to prevent Monzon from testifying because they knew that he would incriminate himself. Just he did when Monzon and the police reenacted what happened at the crime scene at the very beginning of the case. And, and that's another thing that, that almost starts that documentary. And, and one thing I did read about is that one thing they do in general is they will take the suspect to the crime scene and go through their version of offense, uh, events and try to figure out whether they're lying or not. And, and his lawyers were basically correct when asked, by the prosecution about beating his wives and whether he beat Alicia Monzon. They were basically just trying to build a profile to, to just show how, how much of a terrible person he was with his assaults that he, he had done with other his other women and obviously Alicia. And he actually said this, and it's, it's quite it's, it's crazy, but he said, we started to quarrel and I gave her a punch and squeezed her neck a bit. I don't think the punch could have affected her. I hit other women on other occasions and nothing ever happened to any of them. I hit all my women except one and nothing ever happened to any of them. What an absolute scumbag. <laughs> Get off, though. I know, this is crazy. Like, for anybody, <laughs> that, uh, anybody that's listening now and you, you absolutely loved Carl as Monzon as a professional fighter and as a champion of the world and one of Argentina's greatest exports, I don't know if you're going to like him after this podcast episode because all that we're getting portrayed here is uh, an abuser, a guy that felt like it was okay to vilify women, to, to do what he did to women. Absolutely mental that he even goes out of his way to admit when they're doing a reenactment of what happened in the property that he happily admitted and, and admitted to other crimes. That he's literally admitted to other crimes there and then in front of the police. This, this as well. was in the court. This was actually in the court of law that he said that. In the court of law, when he was actually being witnessed, he actually said that. Someone's typing it. I mean, that's that's when he said that. I mean, I'm like, wow, absolutely threw me. I was like, I can't believe that. But yeah, he did. I don't even know what to say, <laughs> mate. I'm absolutely <laughs> gobsmacked. I really am. I can't believe it. So, following Mr. Sunning's discredited eyewitness account, the prosecution team were able to provide. Two further eyewitness statements. Now, Rafael Cristiano Baez said he gave her a one-two combination of cross punches to the face and she fell to the floor. The 57-year-old rubbish collector who passed by the Monzon vacation home with his junk car on the day of her death continued to say that he saw Monzon throw her over his shoulder before chucking her over the balcony like a sack of potatoes. A second eyewitness come forward... Rafael Moyano, who was a waiter in a bar, he later testified he also saw Monzon beat his wife and throw her from the balcony. So, with this evidence mounting against such a weak testimony from Carlos Monzon, he was finally convicted of homicide, or simple homicide, on July the 3rd, 1989, and sentenced to pay court costs for $25,000 to the Munins family and 11 years in prison. And Carlos went on to say, me and my bad temper are the ones that are really responsible. Yes, my bad temper. Well, I don't think there is any way around it. Uh, f for me, looking at all the evidence that we put together, that's on, on the internet. I mean, a lot of these quotes you can find you can put Carlos Monzon in and the case of Monzon and you can find all these quotes from these legitimate people. It's all there. You know, I, I did mention Crime in Spot. It's another podcast that, that did Carlos Monzon. I've got some of this information. We've got some of this information from here as well as obviously the drama uh, of Monzon. And, and, and for me, he, he, he killed her. I mean, in the dramatisation, he actually threw something at her face rather than hitting her. Also, he did slap her about a bit. She tried to run away and escape. She was running upstairs. He rips her clothes off. She's half naked. She ends up in the bedroom. She's begging for him to stop. He bursts through the door. And as you, you rightly said, Sean, this was something on the cards. All the women that he beat, all the girlfriends, and the one lucky girl that never got beat. I, I would like to know who that young girl was. He lost control of himself and he strangled her. He strangled her to death. And then he threw her off the balcony, as that guy said, like a sack of potatoes. And to cover it up, he threw himself off as well to make it look like he tried to save her. 
He also stripped off as well, took all his clothes off. So for me, 100% guilty and deserved to go to prison. But I felt he deserved to go to prison for a bit longer. And the fact they called it a simple homicide threw me as well. I can't believe it. I I'm not quite sure how it's a simple homicide. It's just it's a murder, isn't it? It's crazy. Yeah, I think crazy is kind of how you sum up the case of Carlos Monzon. We talked about his life outside of the ring, his persistent fighting in bars, his persistent and consistent abuse of his wife and future girlfriends and Susana Jimenez and then obviously Alicia Munez and, and then the eventual culminating moment in which he eventually goes on to take her life by what is known as, as, as now as, as strangulation and throwing a lifeless corpse over the top of the balcony and trying to cover it up as well. And that's that's the other thing. Not only was he a scumbag for doing what he did throughout all them years and the way he beat all his girlfriends up and did it in front of his kids as well at, at one particular point with Pelusa, and then to go on to try and cover up the murder of the mother of one of his other children, again is unbelievable and that documentary again I, I keep referring back to it because in the documentary i don't know whether this is true or not but one of the children uh, apparently were in the house at the time yeah. this actually happened so that makes makes it even more sick to be honest with you that he had no regard for women he he felt like women were obviously an object of his desire that that was obviously how he how he looked upon women he would only go to them when he wanted something from them and if they didn't reciprocate whatever that may be then he would he would hurt him he would hurt him and it got to the point where years of hurting women culminated in in the death of somebody and and it could have it could have been more deaths he could have killed more people and remember this was a guy who was a professional middleweight champion of the world he could hit like a brick shit house he could really hurt people so we can't even imagine what some of these women actually endured throughout the course of this tale and, and these years where they'd suffered abuse from the hands of what we once known as a fantastic middleweight champion. And yet we leave this tale and this case thinking about him in a completely different light. And the one other bit of information which I know was a bit more light-hearted but still interesting at the same time was during his sentence in 1993, Mickey Rourke was filming in Argentina. And we know Mickey Rourke as being an absolute massive boxing fan and a little bit of a boxer himself. I believe he had boxed amateur as well at one point. He decided mm. to go and visit Monzon, take a film crew with him. And he managed to convince Monzon to do some sparring in the prison gym. And the first left hook that Monzon landed actually knocked Mickey Rourke out cold. <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> and I think he's 50 years old as well, runs on. Oh, goodness me. I mean, what an idiot. What is he even attempting to step in the ring? I mean, yeah, no, you can't dress it up. The guy was an absolute arsehole, an absolute, oh, he's, a, he's a monster. I mean, I call him a monster bonds on there. That's the first thing that springs to mind. And no doubt he had drug problems. No doubt he had alcohol problems. I mean, there was also a situation where the detective Parise actually tried to, to merge the drugs situation with his friend that they called Turk. I don't know if they just made that name up or if it was a real name, but he was a guy that was selling cocaine and, and he was more interested. He was at the house when Elisa Menez was on the floor dead and he got the drugs removed by putting the, the drugs in his son's backpack and took the two kids, his son as well, uh, and tried to get out of the building because obviously he was worried about the drug side of things. And and the other thing which we didn't mention is that an ambulance was actually called for Carlos Monzon, and he was actually looked at by two paramedics who then took him in an ambulance to the hospital. They didn't even know that Elisa Munez was dead outside. I mean, it, uh, it, it, the whole thing is just crazy. And the other thing as well, which was, it was a female judge as well which which i found quite interesting and her name was alicia so i thought that was also very interesting it was like you know i think people got a bit bored of him man, and i think they absolutely did the right thing and then mickey rock i mean obviously just a boxing fan and he's thinking i'm gonna have a, have a fight with one son and <laughs> gets himself up to that one absolute <laughs> quality <laughs> yeah i thought that was a, uh, yeah. i thought that was a bit of light-heartedness to watch it's been such a such a dark story to, yeah. to discuss so the story ends in January 1995. Monzon was actually given a weekend holiday while serving his term in Carcel de las Flores in Santa Fe, Provenance. 
to visit his family and his children. So on the 8th of January 1995, when returning to prison after that weekend, he and a passenger, Jamino Domingo Matura, were killed instantly when the vehicle rolled over near Santa Rosa de Calchines. The other passenger was actually Monzon's sister-in-law, Alicia Galupe Faisa. She was also injured and Monzon passed away as a result of them injuries sustained in that crash at the age of 52 and that ended the career of what people regard as a boxing legend but in our eyes from this perspective as a human being was as you rightly pointed out just an absolute monster yeah he really was i mean he he, he lived in the fast lane i mean 52 is no age you know he died he, he did serve his term he constantly beat his women, and as we've mentioned, and and the fact is, is that you continually beat your women that way. You know, eventually something like this is going to happen. I mean, the fact that even then, I mean, you can't. The crazy thing with, with the whole situation is she she tried to to get back with him. She was looking to to try and start something new, and 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 she always felt that when he wasn't drinking, he was a nice guy. And he was very paranoid. He was very possessive as well of his of his women. And no one could talk to him. No one could touch him. If they did, they would get in a hiding. It wouldn't be the other fella. Sometimes he would probably drag him up a little bit and tell him what for. But literally, he couldn't even talk to his, his women. And and he was just, he was possessive. And eventually, it happens, isn't it? I mean, you're going to keep punching someone so hard as a professional boxer. I mean, if he if he punched me or you, Sean, he would have, he would have knocked one of us out, let alone what he would have done some of these younger women and and it's inevitable eventually one of them is going to end up what happened i think i think the shocking thing of it obviously that you know he murdered the poor young girl i mean dreadful but the fact he tried to cover it up as well and and still stuck by his story till the day he died he still wouldn't say that actually he did what he did when he's the evidence is there it's pretty clear he strangled her to death and 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 tried to make it look like she, she jumped off which again that makes her look bad, isn't it? Like she's tried to commit suicide. It really is a dark side of boxing. I would always say Monzon is the best middleweight. Probably not so much now after doing this bit of research. I'm sort of, I prefer Hagler all day long for me as they all have package. It's just dreadful. It really is. It is dreadful. It's a dreadful tale. The case of Carlos Monzon and obviously the victims that endured the years of abuse and the untimely death of obviously Alicia Munez and and the heartache that caused to the Munez family and I know there's is there's so many difficulties involved in in doing something like this because I know there was a lot of people that loved Carlos Monzon and refused to believe that he committed this crime even now there'll be people out there that yeah. I can guarantee will still defend him to the hill even though he's no longer on this planet anymore they will still defend him because they know no different they don't fully understand how things really went down on that night and over them years and it's only really the people that lived with him over them years that could really tell you the true tale of of what they referred to him as a monster so this has been a, a dark and gritty episode and what really constitutes the whole premise of the darker side of boxing so we hope that although it's a dark tale you have enjoyed listening to this episode and enjoyed being able to hear more information and facts about a guy you maybe once known as an unbelievable boxing champion only to turn out to be a bit of a distasteful and disgraceful human being and We've enjoyed putting this together for you guys. It's been difficult to to read through some of the stories and difficult to understand the guy that was an animal in the ring was also an animal outside of it and couldn't differentiate between the two. So it's a bit of a sad tale for everybody involved, really. And I hope that you really enjoyed listening to, to these stories. Although it is dark and gritty, we hope that you've enjoyed all the information. And, and obviously, we will want you to go out there and, and look at some of the literature that is out there in the documentary which is currently on netflix it's called monzon and knockout blow that's obviously heavily dramatized more than than what the reality of the situation was and then there is a book coming out later on in 2020 about the life of monzon and i think that will also be a real interesting read and there may be information in there that we've not been able to source as well so if you have enjoyed listening to this episode 
and you want to tune in to listen to more, then you can go and follow us on Twitter at darker underscore side underscore pod. The darker side of boxing. You can find us on all available podcasting platforms. Please go and check it out. Let us know what you think about the episode. Let us know what your thoughts are, if you're a boxing fan, on Monzon now. From what he was, as you known him in the ring, to what he turned out to be outside of the ring. Please let us know, because I'd be really interested to hear how that might have turned people's opinions on this guy. But as always, Johnson, it's been a pleasure going through uh, a deep and detailed story about the career and the case of Carlos Monzon. really has. And and, and just just one last note as well is that there was actually a statue put out of Carlos Monzon in, I believe it was Buenos Aires. And it actually had just said, Carlos Monzon the champion. It actually ended up changing to Carlos Monzo the champion and the murderer. So just wanted to throw that in at the end. I think uh, well, I think the Argentinian public actually realised just how much of a monster he ended up becoming. But yeah, yeah, tragic tale, tragic, tragic for for Elise Jimenez and for everyone involved. Please go and listen and 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 follow us and do read the book when it comes out. So thank you very much for listening to this episode on the curse of Carlos Monzon and the darker side of boxing.